All right, fantastic. Give it up for me. Ace. Yeah, so what happened was I was using the video that uh, actually had audio on it as the uh, background image for the OBS, and I was thinking to myself while I was doing it, I was like, man, I really hope it doesn't play the background sound through the video thing. Then I was like, well, it's only set to video. It shouldn't be set to audio, and I can't hear it through here. And um, I don't know. I thought I was crazy thinking that uh, maybe uh, somebody might have heard it before me. That's so why I was yelling at my girlfriend like it was her fault. Uh, yeah, well, now it's working. Fantastic. Thank you so much, CJ Manuel. Shout out to CJ. Peace. Not going to call in, though. But uh, thank you for telling me in the chat that everything is working now. And that is dope because, I don't know, I was, I was happy about my little uh, Pornhub rant. But, uh, yeah, fuck it. So I guess we're doing the TikTok thing. I'm going to go back to Pornhub. Fuck it. Nobody heard it. Nobody's going to listen anyway. I'm honestly just killing time until 1 p.m. when we have the amazing James Curtis on. Biographer Peace. extraordinaire. I'm not going to let anything get me down whatsoever. I'm not going to let my cat trying to sabotage my show get me down. It takes spiteful shits at me while it's just staring me down trying to do the radio show. It just takes a spiteful shit staring at me using my litter that I pay for. The exorbitant, expensive kitty litter. Only the most expensive cat litter. That actually, when the cat shits in it, it makes the, the room smell better somehow. That's just, you know, the technology that I'm working with. So yeah, TikTok ban. So I'm trying to ban TikTok because the Chinese. Which I have to say sounds pretty great. You know, I always like when the government gangs up against another country. Uh, we're kind of doing it with uh, the whole Ukraine thing, you know, just funding them as a big fuck you to Russia. I like fucking, uh, I like the big middle fingers to uh, to large global powers. So let's do it to a TikTok. So I guess they got to divest whatever company is supposed to divest or TikTok's uh, going to be doing something. I don't know. Um. It's also what what was interesting. So there was some kind of I just read an article about um, the Netherlands or something. I think or some uh, shitty country uh, over there in German land, Doifend Dorves and all of them. Um, I know in the video game uh, department they had to ban what are loot boxes where it's where people uh, pay money for in game items that are mystery randomized and then. Uh, they might get some sort of, uh, you know, high price item. And what they called it was like, uh, you know, gambling aimed at kids, you know, because the whole randomization aspect and using actual money to pay for it. And they passed this law, I don't know, about like five years ago. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but apparently it's just not ever been enforced. So I'm just wondering if they do the TikTok ban um, if that'll actually be enforced and then the Pornhub ban. I'm so annoyed. Yeah, well, thank you, CJ. Give it up again for CJ in the chat saying everything's all Peace. good now. Yeah, to go back to my Pornhub rant, I don't like uh, that Pornhub's trying to get uh, political at me. It's uh, very fucking unsettling. And <sighs> yeah. Uh, uh, <sighs> I want, that's what I'm saying. I'm so annoyed. I, I fucked up the uh, the technical shit so bad in the beginning that I'm thinking, oh, do I go back to the Pornhub situation or do I just keep on pushing forward? I think that's I think it's one of those situations where the only way uh, you know out is just going forward. You can't turn back. It's uh, it's too far in. So let's see um, other interesting facts. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Let me just uh, pull up this sound drop while I pull up the information. Let's see. Animal sex facts. Animal sex facts. Yeah. Animal sex facts. Animal sex facts. Yeah, so. Animal sex facts. 
Oh, okay. I knew that there was a two twofer. I know it goes twice. Or they just keep on going? Oh, shit. It does just keep on going. Well, fuck. Uh, yeah, so in the topic of animal sex facts, um, this, uh, I guess he's a fucking scientist or something. He claims to be a scientist. Um, he's trying to do something about why do birds masturbate? Which is weird because uh, I never heard of birds masturbating. So, and the and so the, somebody made an article to the Audubon Society. It's called "Why Do Birds Masturbate?" Tom Price aims to answer an unorthodox and little studied question about avian behavior. Um, and so this uh, Professor Tom Prof guy, which really sucks. Well, I mean, I don't know. He's like, he's a little bit too happy. Like the way he's smiling at me uh, and he wants to talk about birds jacking off. I think he's a little bit too happy. You know, I don't think he's being scientific enough about it. Yeah. So, and so Zanny Ramirez in the chat says, I was legit scared reading it. If I knew how they do it, would I have a new hobby? So is that trying to capture? So I don't know. Uh, what she's saying there, if she's saying that she would have a new hobby trying to masturbate like a bird or to catch birds in the act of masturbation. So um, it says that uh, birds are not Tom Price's usual bag. Uh, for many years, the evolutionary biologist at the University of Liverpool in England has been investigating the minutia of fruit fly sex lives. But after noticing a conspicuous uh, gap in science regarding self-pleasuring in birds, He's set to become the keeper of the world's first avian masturbation database, which is weird that so that uh, that you would give a fuck, you know, why? Why? So it says uh, there's plenty of anecdotes of captive birds getting it on solo. But Price is wondering whether wild birds also partake in this behavior. To find out, he's put out a call to scientists, veterinarians, and bird owners to fill out a Tumblr, of course Tumblr hosted survey. He'll feed the information into a phylogenetic anal an analysis, analysis, a phylogenetic analysis of self-pleasuring birds, the first of its kind. No shit. So basically, this dude. He says he's an evolutionary biologist. He's a fucking pervert. He's basically uh, calling out to scientists, veterinarians, and bird owners to send in your hottest penthouse forum style bird masturbation stories so he can sit back and jack off to it. And if he gets a chance, he'll put it into his uh, phylogenetic analysis of self-pleasuring birds. What the fuck does that even mean? Does that just mean he, it's it's in a uh, he puts the hottest ones in a scrapbook that he is um, you know adhesed himself with his own makings, probably adhesed is that what it, using adhesives adhesed, uh, I don't know. Uh, Price aims to identify which species of birds masturbate in the wild. What, along with some clues as to why they do it. Previous studies on mammal masturbation suggest that highly sexed species, bonobos, in a parenthesis exclamation mark, are more likely to display self-pleasuring behaviors in the wild. Lekking birds, L-E-K-K-I-N-G, like greater sage grouse, which perform their courtship behaviors in mass, are a good bet, he says. That's because the sexually attractive males get the girls, while the unsuccessful ones may be reduced to uh, relieving their urges on a nearby branch. Let me see. So he's saying he aims to identify which species of birds masturbate in the wild. Along, so let me see. So lecking birds are a good bet, he says. So here's the thing. So he doesn't even know if they fucking masturbate. That's what I'm saying. It's the 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 article's called Why Do Birds Masturbate, right? And I was like, oh, that that's interesting. I didn't even know the birds masturbate. Apparently they don't. He just thinks that maybe these kinds of birds might masturbate. And he's asking everybody to send in stories about what their birds may be masturbating. I don't think this guy understands what the fuck birds are. 
and how like their genitals work. Isn't it like a fucking cloaca usually or some shit? I don't think they have penises. They have like weird um, asshole pussies that they uh, kind of shit into and shit out of until sometimes then one of them is an egg, I think. Um, and also, why are you bothering veterinarians and scientists with that shit? They rub on branches. Falcon sex hats came out in the 1970s. Um, let me see. <sighs> okay. Yeah, please don't anybody call in. Don't anybody call in. Just uh, chat into the chat so I can read that in the middle of the show. Um, yeah, so apparently this Tom Price guy is a fucking bird uh, fetishist. And uh, Zandy's in the chat talking about uh, falcon sex hats, but not in any concise way that I could that I could read it out. Yeah, apparently, Zandy, uh, these uh, birds masturbate on branches. And um, this Tom Price guy should definitely be on a fucking list. He's not a scientist. I don't know what evolutionary biology he's... Like, don't let him anywhere near your bird, please. Because he's got weird... He's like... He, he's putting the fucking... Um, he already knows what he wants to find. He wants to find birds jacking off. And now he's trying to find other evidence to support that, I guess. So what I wanted to do is check out the Tumblr-hosted survey... Let's see what kind of questions this guy's sending out to people. Uh, it's called a survey of why bird species masturbate for a phylogenetic. So first off, I'm going to look up what a phylogenetic is. <sighs> Together, chat. Anybody know what a phylogenetic is? Call in if you know what a phylogenetic is. Uh, 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 in biology, phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary history and relationships among or within groups of organisms. See, that's some bullshit. He's just trying to throw out a word that's so fucking um, vague that uh, nobody can call him on his bird masturbatory nonsense. All right, let's see. Dear colleagues, my co-authors and I are trying to survey which species of birds masturbate for a phylogenetic analysis. There is a pretty good literature on masturbation or masturbation in mammals. But hardly anything on birds. As there are several theories as to why masturbation has evolved, we would be extremely grateful if anyone who is very familiar with behavior in a particular bird species would be willing to complete the following survey and send it back to me at t.price at liverpool.ac.uk. So nobody out there send any emails to t. Period Price, P R I C E, at liverpool.ac.uk. Don't send him any inappropriate stuff, just very scientific, clinical stories of bird masturbation, because he wants it. All right, um, let me see. The questionnaire of bird masturbation, let's see where it's at. And, okay. Wow, this is formatted retardedly. Let me see. Feel free to answer in a don't know to any of the questions. All right. Have you observed masturbation by a bird of this species? Oh, let me see. The behavior we are looking for. We define masturbation as a bird having sex with an inanimate object or their own body, e.g. beaks. Birds typically masturbate by rubbing their cloaca against an inanimate object, often a rock, branch, or something in their cage. This may lead to ejaculation of males. Uh, and a species of bird. Have you observed masturbation by a bird of this species? If not, how confident are you that you would have seen it if it occurred? <laughs> uh, and then it asks, uh, so, and, and levels of confidence. It's very confident I would have noticed my bird masturbating. Fairly confident I would notice my bird masturbating. Not very confident I would know my, uh, that I would know if my bird masturbated or not confident at all that I could identify if my bird was masturbating or not. So apparently, yeah, apparently they do dry hump, much like middle schoolers, birds dry hump. Um, let's see. If you see, I guess everybody dry humps, but, you know, I guess when you get older, you're like, why, why am I doing this? Let's wet hum. Uh, if you see masturbation in this species, what was the sex of the bird that masturbated? Male? Female? Both? 
Approximately, oh, a trans bird? Okay, approximately how many individuals of this species have you seen masturbate? Were they in captivity? Were they solitary? Were they hand-reared? Or uh, uh, were they adult? Do you consider the birds to have been in good condition? Are there any other details you think we should know? Please forward your questionnaire, any questions, to Dr. Price. Holy shit, there's a phone number. Uh, awesome. Well, not going to do anything with that. But, uh, yeah, the phone number is there. Can, can I do something with that real quick? Let's take a look. How, can you, can you call international numbers with the iPhone? With the guy phone? Because I just use it to call my guys. What's up, guys? All right, let's see. How do you use the plus sign? Yeah, plus. Let's see. All right. I'm trying to call this uh, bird pervert. Let's see. Four, four. Uh. Oh, shit. We're only nine minutes away from the WC Fields interview. Perfect. Let's see. One, five, one. James Curtis is coming up, ladies and gentlemen. The award-winning author of WC Fields, A Biography. Ace. And Buster Keaton's biography as well. But today I definitely want to talk to him more about W.C. Fields in the life and times of W.C. Fields and uh, what he learned while researching W.C. Fields and uh, a little bit about James Curtis and just his uh, process of research. And we'll be talking to him in about nine minutes. I'll be giving him a call in about nine minutes. Right now I'm trying to uh, see if I can call up uh, Mr. Tom Price about his... Uh, birding let's see seven nine five all right let's give this the old college try oh shit nine seven nine five four five two five four five two five all right let's try that all right jeez and the music in the back is still a going let's see you got anything over here no dice. But that's just how it happens sometimes. I will get a hold of Mr. Tom Price, and we will find out why birds masturbate. Let's see. Pleaded as dial. Please check the number and dial again. Ah, oh, you or cocksuckers. Dial. This goes all the way to the top. I know what the government's trying to do. They're not going to get one on me. One over on me. Uh, thanks again to... Uh, you think you're going to get uh, an answer on Saturday morning? Yes, because I thought this guy actually cared. I thought he was going to open up the phone. He's like, this is Tom Price. Do you have birds jacking off, please? Yes, this is Mr. Price. Do you have the pictures? Send me pictures here, please. At any time, any day. I'm right here. I need to know about the birds jacking off, please. Did you fill out the form? Did you fill out the survey? It doesn't matter. Just send the pictures. No need for that. Just send the pictures, please. And, man, I am so annoyed. Thanks again to CJ for uh, pointing out the music in the background because that would have been embarrassing. And uh, I'm annoyed about the Pornhub ban. My whole point about that is I don't ever want to go to Pornhub.com. And I will fill out the form, chat. That is a good idea. Please. I'll fill out the form. We should all fill out the form and send him uh, what we've uh, observed birds doing. And... Um, Let's see. You know, my whole take on the Pornhub thing was uh, I don't ever want to hear dear user. Because when you get there, it says, dear user, as you know, you're elected officials in Texas. And I don't want them to ever be telling me that. I don't go to Pornhub for them to try to tell me about freedom of speech and Texas's stated purpose of allegedly protecting minors. I want Pornhub to tell me about porn and who's fucking and come and where it's going and what's the ethnicity of the fucker and the fucky because that's America. Please. Don't try to get your fucking politics and my pornography there, Pornhub, all right? These colors don't run unless it's a, unless it's a genre of... That's the cool thing about porn. You can, do, you can still just do whatever you want to in porn. That is, that is one of my goals is to... Uh, Enter the, the beautiful art of 
pornification. Fornification. I'm also, <laughs> I love how Pornhub's like, uh, uh, Texas wanting a, <laughs> Texas wanting us to verify if you're a minor or not is impeding on your freedom of speech. Don't you understand that if kids can't see pornography, then then America just doesn't shine quite as bright. And uh, yeah, that's a East. that's one way of looking at it. And we are five minutes away from the uh, interview with Mr. James Curtis. So I'm going to get ready for that. I'm going to uh, take a small five-minute break and just try to kind of get my faculties together and get uh, ready to call Mr. Curtis, and hopefully we can get everything smoothed out for that. I'm glad that we uh, got the technical issues figured out early on. I'm glad that we got some people in the chat watching, uh, listening. Thanks a lot for uh, everybody's listening in the future. Thanks a lot for tuning in to the uh, solo show. If you did want to call in, the number is still 210-284-2552. And I'm going to put on a little bit of, uh, what is this, fucking Diablo music. Nah, that's how you turn it on. There we go. I'll be right back. give Mr. Uh, James Curtis a call. Wish me luck. All right. Hello, Mr. Curtis. This is Alonzo with Bad First Impressions, sir. You are live on the air. How are you doing today? Fine. How are you? I'm doing fine, sir. Can you hear me well? Yeah, sure can. 
Well, fantastic, sir. I just want to say, first off, thank you so much uh, for your patience and uh, being on the show. <laughs> we do have sound effects. You might hear a couple of those. Hopefully they're not too loud. If they are, I can always turn them down. But uh, <laughs> And honestly, I'm probably not going to use them too much uh, during the interview. I really want to just pick your brain, sir. Uh, first off, I just want to um, let everybody know that it might just be tuning in. I did post this link into the WC Fields fan group, so thanks everybody out there that might be listening now or in the future. Uh, shout out to you guys. Uh, thank you for supporting uh, WC Fields' memory and all that good stuff. So uh, Mr. James Curtis is an award-winning author. Uh, he has written um, what probably is considered by most the definitive biography of W.C. Fields and also Buster Keaton, two of, uh, you know, everybody obviously considers classics, uh, classic comedy legends, especially in the uh, classic golden uh, age of Hollywood. And, um, yeah, I'm honestly a little bit nervous, sir, so um, uh, please uh, forgive any of my uh, any of my overspeak. I know it's kind of hard to do a phone interview, and I've definitely done most of the talking so far. So uh, please, if you'd like to maybe introduce yourself, and uh, just how are you doing today so far? Yeah, fine so far out here. We're, we're not in any rainy conditions, which is nice after a pretty pretty wet year. And so uh, uh, doing well today. Fantastic. I'm very glad that you could join us today. So um, what John Cleese said about the W.C. Fields book, and I'm reading from the back, uh, the definitive book about America's most profound comedian. James Curtis examines all the myths and stereotypes connected with W.C. and comes up with a fascinating, sympathetic, utterly convincing picture of a man who has a generous yet stingy who is both a dream and a nightmare to work with, who could be warm or distant, who meticulously planned each word and gesture yet who managed always to ad-lib something hilarious. Field shines throughout, sad, funny, and strangely lovable. And for people that might not know, John Cleese is another one of my huge heroes and uh, one of the fun, he's like, who considered like the brains of Monty Python, like the real star of that show. And um, mm -hmm. have you had a chance to meet Mr. Cleese? Oh yeah, sure. And uh, he was, uh he read the book, I think, in manuscript form, if I'm not mistaken. If I, if I remember, this was 25 years ago, of course. But uh, uh, no, he's he was a big, big W.C. Fields fan, still is, and uh, so uh, uh, we had quite a lot of, uh, uh, of time to talk about him and uh, comedy in general. It was a big help in writing the book. Oh yeah, no, it's so funny that um, well, when I got the biography, so um, my relationship with Fields is uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan of him, but I'm such a fan, um, and he has such a, a short amount of work. I try to just uh, watch one of his movies a year, so it's still new to me. So I still have a lot of his stuff that I um, that I haven't seen because I kind of want I don't I, it's my habit to thoroughly absorb somebody as quick as possible and then when there's nothing left there's nothing left with fields so um i really <laughs> i really appreciate so I, I do apologize if i'm not as uh you know as knowledgeable as maybe a lot of the fields fans may be listening and i might be saying stupid things or feel free to correct me because that's what i really want to hear is you are great about um taking the idea of Fields and then um, and really grounding him into who he was. Because I think a lot of people love to get lost in the uh, the character he created for himself. And um, I don't know, just kind of just throwing that out there. Sorry. Well, well, that was the idea behind the book, that nobody had up to that point treated him as a serious biographical subject. And uh, I wanted to write a book about... Uh, a, a true artist and a man and not a cartoon character. And uh, so it was a very simple, it was an absurdly simple thing to do, and uh, uh, it produced the book that you have. Yeah, and so as I'm, as I'm reading it, uh, you, you have just so many things I've never even heard or even thought to think about with W.C. Fields. You start off, like, from just his great-great-grandparents and just, like, before... But by page 11, we haven't even got... We, we just get to Fields by page 11, and by then you kind of understand where he's even, you know, wh where Fields has become before Fields was even an idea. And I think that just gives... Um, it already just grounds him uh, right there to, to people. So some things I wanted to ask um, with uh, with W.C. Fields, what was the biggest surprise you found uh, while researching him um, that, that you could think of uh, just offhand? 
Well, as much as anything, I was surprised by some of the material I had access to. Uh, uh, he, he was a very dedicated juggler during his early days of performance, and uh, uh, he, he tried to master a particular trick where uh, he would balance a cane on his foot and then toss the cane up in the air, and uh, it would land. It, it the way it would work, I'm thinking back now, the way it would work was a, the, the, there was a top hat on top of the cane, on the handle of the cane. Uh, there was a cigar on uh, the, um, the on top of the hat. And the idea was that he would, t- he would balance this uh, cane on one foot and kick it up in the air, and the hat would land on his head, and the cigar would, uh, could be caught in his mouth. And uh, he worked on that trick for a long time. And... I always wondered where it came from, and uh, it turned out that the Library of Congress had an original script from a t- stage show that Fields noted in print, as a matter of fact, that he saw once, and in there the trick is described. So he was uh, he was trying to master a trick he had seen on uh, stage himself. Um, he early on became uh, very concerned that any trick that he he uh, attempted or kitted on stage had to be one that he could do legitimately. In other words, if uh, if he couldn't master four or five balls juggling them, then uh, he wouldn't kid that. Uh, uh, I remember one time he talked about um, an act that was in Wadville called uh, The World's Laziest Juggler. And what this guy did for his act was he would come out on stage and throw things into the air like dishes and the like and just let them crash to the floor. That was supposed <laughs> to be funny. And Fields uh, had great contempt for this guy because he really couldn't do what he was pretending to do. Uh, so he, he insisted he had he had to be able to do a legitimate juggling act before he could do a comedy act. And uh, he worked very hard at it. Well, it's uh, that's a fascinating thing. So... Um... He's very method in that way, where even with the tricks of the camera and stuff, he's like, "Now nah, the the character has to be able to do that." Which also probably mm-hmm. is why his characters are so real and believable because it is just Fields, as and he's just like such a amazing person. And so here's a, so I guess I, I might have had a misconception when I was first coming into Fields because maybe a lot of people might have this, or maybe I'm one of the few, but maybe as a younger person coming into Fields, I had this misconception that he isn't as celebrated in Hollywood, maybe as a Chaplin or as a Buster Keaton. And I, for some reason, I had this impression that maybe it was because of how much he kind of fought against the Hollywood system um, in his age. So it didn't maybe lend itself in the future to his works being um, kind of portrayed in the way that Chaplin's is, because Chaplin's kind of considered this... uh, you know, almost saint-like character in Hollywood, and I just am always wondering why. Why is Fields never mentioned in these conversations? And it feels like back in the day he always was, but now it's almost like he's being erased. Well, these guys go through stages where they're more popular or less popular. Authors are like that to some degree as well. And uh, Fields is very big back. Uh, well, when I was in college in the early 1970s, and um, there were uh, repertory theaters that would show different films every night. And you got a wide variety of things. One night might be a Fleeny film, and the next night you'd see the Marx Brothers. Uh, and uh, Fields was uh, went through a phase where he was revived everywhere. Uh, he and Humphrey Bogart were the two nonconformists of that period, and they were celebrated for it. Uh, and I think to a certain degree, their characters be- became more ingrained in the culture than their individual films. Uh, you, if you ask somebody back at that time about W.C. Fields, they could probably rattle off a list of, uh, of characteristics. He had a big nose. He drank a lot. Uh, he was he was a juggler. Uh, he was uh, mean to some degree. Uh, he was a, a, a fraudster, a, a, a grifter in a lot of his films, etc. So you could get a quick sketch of him you know jack benny was another one like that people became so familiar with his character he was 39 years old he was cheap he drove a maxwell etc cetera, etc cetera. uh so so i think fields was celebrated more for who he was as a character at that time than as a filmmaker and one of the things i wanted to do with fields is uh show him from the technical side to some degree. And uh, you might notice that on the inside frontispiece of, of the book, 
it's a picture of him leaning on a camera on a on an exterior set. So you've got the sense that he was contemplating seriously how this scene that he's about to do was going to be uh, filmed. And with the Buster Keaton book, I, I deliberately called it A Filmmaker's Life because I wanted to show as much as anything what Keaton did behind the camera as well as what he did in front of it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that uh, that, that is fascinating. When we talk about uh, W.C. just uh, W.C. Fields being known more as a character, um, and it d- does feel like that's um, a lot of by design. Did you ever feel almost like you're digging up his corpse? Um, you know, almost <laughs> when you were when you were kind of digging into things, did you almost feel like he might have uh, he might be mortified to to see that people uh, would know uh, so much about him when he seemed like such a purposefully. Uh, what, what would you call it? Um, private. Calcu- yeah, private and um, and calculatedly private. You know, almost like uh, um, paranoid. Well, you I might think, call it. I think I think that he liked the idea of the public perceiving him as the character that he played, and not necessarily as a private citizen. Uh, he did make the papers occasionally. He was sued a couple of times, and so he'd go to court. But uh, uh, those those things would be covered, of course. But uh, uh, when he got the most exposure before the American public, I think that he ever got was when he went on radio in 1937 and uh, uh, went up against Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. And uh, that's where a lot of his image got uh, really uh, uh, imprinted on the popular mind because uh, um it was an exchange of insults about two thirds of the way through uh, a one hour radio show. And uh, the audiences got to where they would stay tuned just to hear it. And uh, it was always something or other where uh, uh, Charlie would start out being a respectful young man and uh, Fields would say something insulting to him. And so he would start out and they'd, they'd start bantering back and forth and he would make uh, Charlie would make references to his big red nose and his drinking and that sort of thing. And so that's what audiences took away from that. And uh, later on, his character became, let's say, less nuanced a little bit because he was kind of leaning into that. Uh, but he, he'd rather be known by that character than by uh, the real guy that he was, I think. I think he thought, and he was of that generation where they thought, you know, that uh, you keep your private life separate from what you do in public and what you do uh, in your work and uh and buster i think felt pretty much the same way yeah there's definitely a certain uh dignity uh that that doesn't really exist with the stars um these days it feels like probably by our own doing you know uh but um definitely so i was kind of looking through the index what i also love about this book is again uh this is james curtis the author of wc fields a biography and it's almost like um um, would you call it an encyclopedia about fields because you can really uh go through the back and if you're looking at about a certain question you might look for you can look through the index and then find that um that section about it and it's very in-depth i was looking for stuff about the bundy drive boys and i was in um um, I'd be able to find it right away, but I like I haven't had a chance to go in depth at, with the book as I'd like to. Um, and uh, is is that how much of that is true with the um, Weekend at Bernie story? Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, it might be rumor, or if it's ever been confirmed that that's what actually happened. I think it was. Jeez, uh, I, I you say his name a lot, and he's uh, referenced a lot. Um, I forget the Jim Fowler. Fowler, but uh, Barrymore, Did, was it Barrymore? John Barrymore. Yeah, John Barrymore. But wasn't there uh, one of? Was Barrymore died and they got his body for one last uh, hoorah kind of thing? I don't believe that. I think that's just uh, something that Raul Walsh made up, and Raul Walsh <laughs> told a lot of fanciful stories, and uh, that was just one of them. But uh, no, I don't buy that one at all. The, the the thing the thing that's necessary, I think, to aspire to write a good biography or good history of any kind, I think, is you need a natural skepticism over the various legends that have come out over time. And uh, when I started this book, uh, there, there were a lot of legends uh, attending the W.C. Fields, and I wasn't. I determined I wasn't going to use any of them unless I could verify them. And some I did verify. 
uh, like slipping uh, uh, gin to baby Leroy on a movie set. That so did that shocked me. Yeah, because I listened to yeah. your interview with um, uh, Ronald Fields and mm-hmm. uh, uh, the other one. I listened to it twice, and I was shocked because I always thought that that was one of the rumors. But then the way that you kind of uh, put it out there, I was like, well, it is kind of of the time. They used to put you know whiskey in kids when they're teething and stuff like that, so it wasn't necessarily like. Uh, wasn't the craziest thing. I'm sure it wasn't also, uh, you know, it probably still looked down upon even then. Um, and another thing you mentioned during that interview was, so the, the Mae West thing, uh, you said he was very deferential to Mae West. And I was always under the impression that they butted heads a lot and that he, um, and that he wasn't. And you kind of made it sound like he actually knew that well, Mae, Mae West, uh, her star was on the rise and was kind of hot at the time. And he really wanted to do something with her um, as kind of... That, Actually, she was past her her vogue at that point. Really, and uh, uh, Fields was a very courtly man. You know, let's remember he was uh, he was born in 1880, so uh, he came of age about the time of Queen Victoria's reign. Wow! And uh, he was descended from an Englishman, his father, and um, so he was he was very good with women and even may west who had a lot of contempt for him uh he was very careful with her um he was the sort of guy that when he was at home for instance and the black maid would come in to straighten things up or vacuum or whatever she did he would stand up and uh that's insane yeah well no that's a man of his time and uh the thing, the truth of the matter is, with My Little Chickadee, he thought their characters would mesh well. And uh, he ceded top billing to Mae West in order to get a co-writing credit on the film. Um, in, in, um, in actuality, she was not considered nearly as popular an uh, attraction as he was at that point. Uh, to give you an example, he, he was paid $150,000 to make that film. Uh, she was paid fifty thousand. Wow! And the studio had an option on a second picture with him, and it would, not with him, but just a second picture with Mae West. And they did not exercise that option. They didn't want her for another film. And my little chickadee, she did one more film at Columbia Pictures in nineteen forty. Was it two? Called the Heat's On, and she was billed below the title in that one. First time that had happened wow. in a while. And that was the last film that she made until Myra Breckenridge in the 70s. So uh, I actually had, I was wondering, have you ever, um, it sounds like you know a lot about Mae West. Did you ever think about doing something about Mae West? Or did you feel like you kind of already covered it and maybe some of the other stuff? I think she's been done pretty well by others. Uh, The one reason, when I take on one of these projects is because I think there's a need for it. uh, That there's a hole that needs to be filled. And... With Mae West, I think she's been done a, a number of times, and she's an interesting character in herself, very egotistical. Um, but I think she knew that she was at a disadvantage in that film, and that's why she disparaged uh, Field so much, especially after his death later on. Uh, also, her sister was an alcoholic. I think her name was Beverly, and uh, Mae West didn't drink. And oh, so wow. I think she had a natural aversion to people like Fields. That that uh that does make sense because um and that's interesting I'll have to look um into some of the books about Mae West because the, the saying that I uh, you know I really do feel like this book filled a hole because there's a lot about fields but um not necessarily uh what you would want to uh, how to put it uh, you know the real story you know because a lot of it is just um you know rumors and stuff like that so it, it, this is really um really well, thank the popular- you for that. The popular book on Fields for a long time was written by Robert Louis Taylor, who was a writer for The uh, New Yorker, and it was published in 1949. And it was still in print in paperback uh, you know, when I was in college. Uh, it's called W.C. Fields' His Follies and Fortunes. I have that one, yeah. And, yeah, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fun read. It's a, it's, it's a funny book. Uh, but a lot of it isn't particularly true. I mean, this is one of the problems that uh, I wanted to uh, tackle. Uh, uh, he, what he was doing was putting forth Fields as the character, as the character he played on screen, and that's all well or fine as far as you know what you might be looking for as a reader. But uh, I wanted to know what went on behind the scenes, and I wanted to know how the gears worked, and uh, so that's that was the reason I took this on was to uh, uh, take another look at him in a different light. 
Yeah, that that is a great way of putting it. Almost like um, if a Homer Simpson had a biography about the character Homer Simpson, and then you actually did it about the guy that did the the voice of him. You know, it'd yeah. Be, it's very very interesting way of putting it. Ed, so did you learn um, anything about yourself while you're uh, researching W. C. Fields' uh, life? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, only that I was surprised. I'd, I'd have to say at the number of people I had available to talk to. Still, I, I thought when I took on Fields that I was going to be down to maybe a handful of people, and I was mistaken in that. Uh, I have a tendency when I start one of these, especially since I'm dealing with an old subject like Keaton or Fields, uh, I'll, I'll make a list of people I'd like to talk to, then I'll triage by age. And so up at the top of my priority list on Fields, as I remember, were uh, several Ziegfeld Follies girls that were still alive. One was 101, as a matter of fact. Wow. And, uh they had worked with him on stage back in the 19, well, starting in 1915 when he joined the Follies until 1925. And uh, they were all very sharp and very with it. One was still dancing, as a matter of fact. She died at 106. Wow. And uh, so I, I had her, those people to talk to. Uh, I, I knew of others that had worked behind the scenes with him. Um, uh, children who worked with him, Jane Withers, for instance. Uh, so I, I was just kind of astonished at the number of people I was able to talk with. And uh, it was very fortunate for me to be able to do so. And uh, I think there's a lot, uh, in fact, people that knew him when he would uh, stay at, uh, at this uh, resort out in Riverside County uh, to, to uh, kids and people who came across him in a very private sense. And uh, there's one story in there, for instance, about uh, this is at Saboba Hot Springs. And uh, uh, he saw the Indian kids one day playing baseball uh, with a stick and uh, a ball of twine that they had put together. They didn't they couldn't afford uh, proper equipment at all. And he found the golf pro, whose name was Lubo, and he took a wad of money out of his pocket and put it in Lubo's hand. He said, Lubo, go out and buy those kids some proper proper uh, uh, equipment. And he said, if you tell anybody, I'll cut off your booze, because he would give Lubo a little, uh, one of those little, uh, kind of like what you get on an airplane these days uh, to, for him every morning, so he could have a little snort before he, uh, he got to work and uh he said, I'll, I'll cut off your booze. So uh, Lubo went out and he got balls and uh, bats and mitts and whatever these kids needed. And those kids had good good, good equipment to play with. And so that's that's an interesting little vignette about him that uh, you wouldn't get from any other biography. No, definitely. Uh, yeah, I've never heard that at, at all, honestly. And um and so I had, a, I had a friend that really wanted to ask you this uh, about the ending because uh, she likes to go to the end of books and see how they end. And uh, mm -hmm. she said, did you feel it was important uh, to to end the book with uh, Fields' death? And did you feel like that was a natural ending, uh, I guess, for for you? His, well, his death, the, I guess? the ending actually... The ending actually is two part. There, there were a lot of headlines that were generated after he died because of his estate and um, his uh, widow. He remained married uh, until he died, but they weren't living together. They were estranged. And he had a son. He actually had two sons, as it turned out, but he had one that was legitimate and uh, who had become an attorney. And so uh, he helped his mother gain access to the estate, uh, the field's fortune, if you want to put it that way. And... Um, so the family already, already, always had kind of a, a difficult relationship with him and his memory because uh, they were reared uh, in a house where his name was never mentioned, although uh, stored at the house were his papers and his uh, his artifacts and the like, his, his juggling equipment in some respects. And uh, so I took it through to the present day because – or not the present day, but uh, uh, back in the 70s, I think, is when it ends – uh, I'll have to read my own book again sometime. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, it's about uh, one of one of Fields' grandsons, Everett, who, whom I knew pretty well. And uh, his father and his father had a uh, 
habit uh, every Christmas of putting flowers on his mother's grave in Culver City. And Everett went with him, and he, he told me this story and I, at, at, at the bar at the Magic Castle, as I remember. And uh, he said to his father, do you think we should put flowers on your father's grave as well? And that hadn't occurred to his father. And so he, he said, well, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And so they drove out to Glendale to Forest Lawn where W.C. Fields was in a niche in the uh, Great Mausoleum. And uh, there – and uh, – they uh, it, it became kind of a reunion between his estranged son and the memory of Mr. Fields, and so I ended the book with him in prayer at the at the grave, and uh, I did that for a couple of reasons. One of which I wanted to give the reader something that they weren't expecting, and B, I just wanted to kind of underscore the difficulty of not only his own family life, but uh, a lot of people who end up in difficult situations with family relationships and uh, and kind of how um, uh, Claude Fields uh, bridged that gap finally before he died himself. Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, that's that sounds like a really beautiful uh, way of ending it because I do, uh, if I remember on the uh, interview correctly, uh, his grandson didn't even realize he was. Uh, the grandson of Fields until he was about nine years old and was watching one of yeah. the, uh, the films on TV, which it seems like it seems like such a crazy uh, thing to. But but I, I'm sure you know uh, you know how how crazy that family drama can be and how deep those grudges can go, uh, and yeah, it, it, it's insane. So with Fields. Um, it might sound like a kind of a hack question. Did he have a good relationship with his own family after he got famous? Uh, any of them? I know he had. A, he really didn't get along with his dad. I know that um, they kind of were at ends. Because I think there's some maybe some abuse. Or I don't know how much of that was exaggerated. Well, it, it was a it was a rough childhood. I think just because uh, it was a rough period in our history, and uh, you know there. there the social services weren't there that perhaps there are today, the social safety net, if you will. And, uh, and so I, and, and also his father was, uh, a, a drinker and, uh, a violent drunk apparently. And, uh, so they didn't get along uh, later on when he became an adult, uh, fields was, um, uh, I, I think more solicitous toward him. And, uh, his father, uh, James Dukenfield, died in 1913 when Fields was had become a, one of the standard acts in vaudeville. So uh, uh, I think he was proud of his son's uh, uh, success, and I, I think at the end of their, his life, they were getting along okay. Uh, he was really close to his mother, who really kind of looked like him. Uh, she had... The the big nose was the Felton nose, and uh, <laughs> Kate Felton was her maiden name. And so uh, she died in 1925, but if you look at older pictures of Kate Felton, uh, uh, Kate Dukenfield, I should say, uh, she looks very much like uh, her uh, her son, uh, Bill, and uh, or Claude, she always called him. And uh, uh, so I, I think she was quite... Uh, uh, quite influential. In fact, uh, there's a scene in one of his uh, talking short subjects. Uh, I, th I think it's a barbershop, and he's sitting uh, uh, on, a, on a bench uh, outside his barbershop, and he's commenting uh, to one uh, uh, to, uh, about the various people as they go by. He greets them very pleasantly, and then as they walk on, he says something as an aside about them to uh, uh, what, what, uh, somebody who's sitting next to him, and uh, that was very much the way Kate Felton acted. She, she would she would smile and greet people, and then she had something nasty to say about them when they could, were out of their shot. And uh, he further tips you off at the beginning because the first uh, shot in that short subject is a banner being reared over the uh, main street of this little town. It says "Welcome to Feltonville." <laughs> so, uh, uh, that, that's that's your clue. Uh, but but yeah, he drew a lot of stuff from life, and uh, in in cases like this, they weren't so much anecdotes about things that happened, but about people. Yeah, and it's interesting to think of uh, W. C. Fields as an artist, um, because uh, 
So, and, and when it comes to his writing, something that you mentioned that uh, I hadn't really thought about before, but especially because it was vaudeville, um, how much of what he wrote was um, was his original stuff, um, and how much of it do you think was probably standards of the time that he kind of um, made his own with his own character? Um, a lot of it was original because of his character. Um I think he was one of those guys, one of those comedians who uh, everything grew out of character, uh, plot, et cetera. So uh, uh, it wasn't like he was preconceiving a notion of what was going to happen in Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, and then he was going to drop his character into that. It was more a matter of taking a situation and putting that particular character into that situation, and what would develop as a result would be uniquely his. Uh, so, you know, you could take Fields, that character of his, and you could even set him. Well, this is this is a hypothetical. He never did this, but you could say, for instance, uh, put him in a situation where he has to be a, a department store Santa for a day, and uh, so, and he has to put children on his lap, et cetera, who are not always well behaved. And uh, you can just take his character, his movie character, and run with that idea, and it gives you all kinds of ideas of how. It, play out and uh so and occasionally he encountered children in his films there's that uh, scene in the bank dick where uh, this little boy has a has a plastic uh, uh, cap gun that uh, he's he's toting and uh field sneaks up behind him as the bank uh the bank guard and uh grabs hold of him and uh and uh his mother pulls him away from him, and he says, "Is that gun loaded?" And he says, and she says, "No, but I think you are." <laughs> and then, and then the kid says, "Look, ma, this man has a funny nose." And she says, "You mustn't make make fun of people's uh, looks." She says, "Besides, you'd like to have a nose like that full of nickels, wouldn't you?" I love that line. Um, that yeah. nose full of nickels. It's such a funny way of even thinking about something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, but that that was the thing. It was like him kicking uh, Baby Leroy that time after he had uh, had his uh, watch uh, dropped in a bat of molasses. You know that sort of thing. Yeah, it's um, definitely interesting. And I just want to let you know, uh, we are at the uh, 30 minutes, so I, I don't want to take up any more of your time if you have to go somewhere. But if you have uh, any more free time, I'd love to, you know, finish up the conversation. But if we have to. Um, OK, by, by all means, go ahead. You know, I, I love. No, I don't want to. I don't want to cut it off at all. Um, I just want to let. I just know that I asked uh, for thirty minutes of your time, and I don't want to impose any longer than you might, because I don't know if you have anything else going on. Because I'd love to keep on talking with you about W. C. Fields as long as you have time for it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm okay until noon time. Well, fantastic. So it's about what twenty eight minutes till noon. No, it's, uh, you know, it's about it's eleven thirty two. According, I'm in California, so it's eleven thirty two. My my clock right now. So. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And uh, Ted uh, Winnikeck, please allow James to continue. Yeah, I'm not trying to cut James off at all, uh, everybody. I just want to make sure that um, I'm not taking advantage of his awesome disposition, okay? I'm so sorry, sir, for any interruption on my part. So, um, yeah, w w when it comes to uh, – when we're talking about uh, – when Fields is uh, – being uh, really famous in the 70s and bringing back now because I do feel uh, as you're saying a lot of his stuff is so unique but I feel like a lot of what uh, his unique stuff is is being replayed so much in modern day comedies I feel like it's very mm -hmm. weird that you don't hear people say oh wow that's so fields like what just the mall Santa thing um, you can just see that in your head automatically like oh that would be perfect for fields but then you think oh bad Santa is kind of taking uh, almost a fields like character maybe making it a little more darker but you could definitely see yeah. Fields almost playing that, and almost probably based off of the humor that Fields created with the 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 misanthrope drunk that's actually kind of the con artist, also at the end of that movie. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, part of it though is Fields was always looking uh, for a clever way of getting something across, and I think I think there's such a tendency with comedians these days in film, especially. Uh, they shoot the first draft. They don't think about going back and refining what they're doing. And uh, Fields, I think, <clears throat> pardon me, Fields, Fields, I think, would be appalled by the language that's used these days and is taken for granted. And that doesn't mean he wouldn't have used it himself. <laughs> but 
Back in the days of uh, the production code, uh, there were a lot of forbidden words, more than George Carlin seven, and uh, and so he would come up with ways of expressing himself similarly with different words. Like, for instance, uh, instead of saying "God damn it," he'd say "Godfrey Daniel," <laughs> and he he could get he could get away with that. Uh, the censors wouldn't give him any trouble with it, but uh, the audience understood what he meant. Uh, Godfrey Dukenfield, for instance, was an uncle of his, so that's where that came from. But uh, you, you got the G and the D in there. Uh, instead of son of a bitch, he said mother of pearl. But he would say mother of pearl in a context where one would normally swear. And so that's a lot more distinctive way to get across that particular attitude, that emotion, than just to say, oh, fuck, you know, you, 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 uh, you've got a situation where – uh, someone's thought about this, and they're putting it in a delightful new way, and it gets the it gets the idea across, and it's in a way that you wouldn't have thought of before, which is one of the uh, great cornerstones of uh, of good good comedy, I think. Yeah, that's what I love about Fields is that he's um, as much as he's a physical comedian, he's also very much a thinking man's comedian. But also, the words here just can be funny to a child. You know, the way he says stuff, it can just work as a, a cartoon character. But he also works as kind of a, more of a Dickensian character or Mark Twain kind of character. You know, that you'd come across. Uh, and um, yeah, that is very well. I think there's more depth there. You know, in other words, if you're a child and you're looking for something that's funny and amusing, you can get uh, be set in front of fields and you can watch him do physical things like fight with uh, fly paper or you know do some juggling or uh, or uh, 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 kick baby Leroy in the butt. Uh, on the other hand, if you're uh, an adult and you understand a little bit more from where he's coming from. You can see the subtext in a lot of that, and I think that's where John Cleese was uh, 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 going with his uh, comments about Fields. Was that uh, it was a uh, Fields worked for audiences on multiple levels. Not all comedians were like that, but uh, Fields definitely was. Yeah, definitely uh, an all ages comedian, and also a, a comedian for the ages. You know, uh, uh, it, it's mm -hmm. his stuff is just as timeless uh, when you watch. Like I say, it's um, I almost feel like when I'm watching Field stuff, I'm like, how how is um, anybody getting away with doing just straight up Field stuff? You know what I mean? Without crediting the guy or people saying, oh mm -hmm. well, Fields did it first. Fields did it. Uh, did it better? Is, and speaking of uh, modern day comedy, are there any comedians, or maybe a couple comedians? Uh, I don't know how how often you keep up with uh, comedy this day and age. Um, there's so many of them that maybe reminds you of Fields, or that uh, you think Fields would have uh, hated. <laughs> he would have been like, ah, oh, that guy. I, I you know, I, I, they're not new, but I, I think that the Pythons would would uh, uh, resonate with Fields. Uh, I think he would appreciate their uh, off-center approach to things, and uh, um, and the the various they didn't all play one character, obviously. Although some of them um, became known more for uh, uh, a certain uh, factor of behavior, I think you know, like uh, Eric Idle or or Cleese. Uh, but I think that um, I, I I think the inventiveness is all part of it, and. Uh, Today it's just tough to think of somebody offhand who would fall into that classification. He was really Fields, I think, was unique, and it's the same thing with with most comedians who have lasted. God knows there were enough comedians back in the 20s and 30s who came and went, and they're completely forgotten today. Uh, Wheeler and Woolsey, for example, you can't find anyone under 80 who knows who they are, except uh, maybe a, a few film fanatics. Uh, personally, I don't think their uh, stuff uh, ages very well, but uh, Fields you can still sit and, and watch and laugh at. And uh, Buster Keaton, he was working a century ago. And uh, I've introduced a number of his films over the last year and a half since the book came out. And uh, the audiences are great. Um, we sold out on occasion, and uh, they, they respond beautifully to his work. It lasts. Chaplin is like that, his best stuff. Uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, Harold Lloyd, if you get a chance to see him, uh, et cetera. But, but uh, uh, I think, I think the, the, the thing that unites them all is they're all unique characters. You won't mistake one for the other. 
you know, you could look at jazz singers the same way. You know, nobody sounds like Nat King Cole or, uh, you know, June Christie, people like that. It's the same idea. You've got something that's so individualistic that you're putting forth, and nobody can copy it. So uh, this uh, some of the interesting that uh, I noticed a lot of books that I want to cover, and I want to get into yours uh, to, for this information. Um, so Fields, a uh, young Fields as the con man with the professor, um, and how long do you would you say that he uh, that he you know was doing cons? And do you, are, are there any stories of things that he would do even in his in his later life that he has never kind of got rid of, like maybe old habits die hard with the, with the conning or with the kind of scamming kind of stuff that he might've, uh, that he might've picked up as a kid. I, I think what he picked up as a kid that followed him through his life was poverty. You know, he, he, he was, uh, scarred by not having any money and having to live kind of, a uh, uh, very much a hard scrabble existence, and when he later became successful, he guarded that money very carefully. And uh, he was known uh, for being a, a soft touch, but he didn't want anybody to know about it because he didn't want people lining up at his dressing room door. But uh, but if uh, someone uh, at Paramount, you know, one of the crew members or someone, would have a, a misfortune of some sort or a, a medical emergency or whatever. <clears throat> he would he would arrange to take care of something like that, but he he was always very careful not to let people know who did it. Um, and so I, I think that followed him through his life. The characters he met very early on, even in childhood, uh, informed his uh, comedy later on. I think the way that played out for him was that that was material, and uh, he was able to take bits and pieces of things that uh, you, know, you know. I was told a story one time about. Marlon Brando, and he's sitting with some people in a coffee shop, and he's only halfway listening. He's watching other people. And at one point, he pointed out to someone something that uh, a woman did, a little physical gesture of some sort in a situation. And he did that because he was going to remember it. And uh, so, you know, people are always building their toolboxes. They're putting uh, new things in it, and uh, they result in in – delightful discoveries sometimes yeah so it's interesting so you're saying that um uh fields uh so when fields was maybe uh, learning cons and stuff like that he didn't really carry that on with them uh, in the attitude or just more of just well, uh, no, the he, what he did was yeah. he understood how those worked yeah. and so later you can go into a film like uh, uh oh uh you can't cheat an honest man where he's uh, selling uh tickets to amazing the circus, and scene then when he gives somebody yeah. He doubles the bill over so it looks like they're, they're, uh, there's more money in the change than there is. Things like that. Those are old uh, carny tricks. And uh, he knew them all intimately. And uh, so, uh, and he would play characters who could be, oh, let's say, excused to some degree uh, when they do something like that. There's a, there was a motivation behind them. And the, in this case, it was because he was trying to keep the circus running and keep people employed. But. Uh, you know, you don't think about that at the time. It's more a question of, okay, he's taking these people for a few bucks, and uh, he's using a time-honored method of doing so. <laughs> and uh, uh, So I, I, I think everything that he experienced in youth especially, but the later on as well, was uh, a source of comedy for him, that he could take it and use it. No, very good. It almost reminds me of, um, I was wondering, if uh, or I'm just kind of thinking to myself, I wonder if there's any con artists that were a little annoyed at Fields for making that, making that scene and kind of smartening up the chumps out there, you know, by uh, exposing uh, some of his uh, cons in the movies. Well, that, that's how Penn and Teller uh, uh, got famous. It was the same same idea. They were kind of revealing how these things work. But uh, oh. I, I think I think the best uh, cons uh, depends upon simple human nature. Uh, the whole idea that you can't cheat an honest man goes back to uh, uh, the old uh, shell game, you know, the, the three uh, walnut shells and the pea. And uh, uh, the guy would uh, put the pea, make sure that uh, uh, the uh, the mark saw the pea, and then he'd move the shells around and there'd be a bet placed. And, uh, and that's how he made his money. And the idea was that anybody who is ripe for a con, in other words, to be victimized by a con man, has a little bit of larceny in them. There's something dishonest about them. 
and that therefore, well, for instance, on the P situation, the idea was that somehow you would give, if you're, you're, you're working that particular game, uh, you'd let the victim or the uh, intended victim think he saw something that he wasn't supposed to see, like he saw where the P was. It, it was a mistake or it was, a, it was a supposedly a mistake. And if he were an honest man, he'd say, uh, you better start that over again because I saw the P. But no, if you have a little larceny in a heart, your heart, you're going to say nothing about it whatsoever. And that's when you get sucked in. Also, uh, and so you can't cheat an honest man. If you're not honest, you're you're right for it. And you probably wouldn't even be at the shell game in the first place because it's probably not a legal thing to do. So even being there at first, <laughs> you're not being very honest. Yeah. You know, so there's a there's a right right there. They've already marked you as a person that uh, hey, you know, not yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, that's a, such a, a very interesting point. And um, so well, look at today. Mm-hmm. Look, look at email today. You know the the kind <laughs> of junk that comes over uh, in, in your inbox or ideally in your junk file, and they're things that are trying to work you in with, uh, bring you in with um, uh, offers of uh, great discounts or free money or you've just won something, et cetera, and so you're going to click on something that's going to download malware into your um, computer. Uh, the same thing, if you weren't greedy like that, you would just delete those things and move on. It's the people who kind of self-select by responding to that sort of thing that become the suckers. Yeah, it's very just uh, it, this carnival, uh, carnival mentality that just uh, yeah, has never really gone away. It's the uh, what, probably maybe not the oldest profession, but maybe the second oldest profession. You know, <laughs> 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 this is a, the lie. But um, very interesting. So, um, is there? Or do you have any uh, books that you're working on coming up? Um, is there anything that that's really interesting you right now? Maybe not even books, but another project yeah. that's. Uh, you know, I've got uh, I'm working on one right now, and the title of it is "Comedy is a Grim Business." Oh wow! And it's it's about the making of a movie called "It's a Mad, 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 Mad World." Okay. And who made that movie? A man named Stanley Kramer. It was uh, released 61 years ago, and it was designed to be the greatest comedy of all time, and a very it, it very nearly was, amazingly enough. But uh, the idea behind it was that every working comedian in 1962 would be in it, with a few exceptions. And uh, so they had a cast of about 50 to 70 well-known faces. The story itself ran for three and a half hours. It had an intermission. Wow. It was shot in Cinerama. And uh, it's... Uh, I think one of the more repeated films on TCM these days. Uh, you can rent it off Amazon. Uh, but the main stars of it are people like Milton Berle and Sid Caesar. Uh, Buster Keaton is in it. Uh, Jonathan Winters. Um, Edie Adams. Uh, blah, 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 Dick Sean. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on some of the names at the moment. But uh, uh, just an just a, a absolute... Uh, Amazing assembly of people. Uh, uh, Jack Benny is in it. Uh, Jerry Lewis is in it. Uh, uh, I'm looking at it right now. Spencer Tracy, Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, Buddy Hackett, Ethel Merman, Mickey Rooney, Dick yeah, Jones, are. Phil Silvers, Terry Thomas, Jonathan Winters, Eddie Adams, Dorothy Provine, just to name a few. Yeah. And so, what what uh, what drew you to that? Because I'm I'm looking at the Wikipedia article right now, and it, I love because um, I, I did see uh, International House. I thought that was such a cool idea, um, you know, with Emerson mm-hmm. Field. So, what was the um, why why is, did, was it a grim business? Well, because it was so it was almost an impossible film to get made, and Stanley Kramer said uh, after he was finished with it. Uh, if ever a book is written about how this thing was made, it needs to be called uh, Comedy is a Grim <laughs> Business. And so I thought, perfect title. Thank you very much, Mr. Kramer. <laughs> wow, you really just so uh, thought, served that one up for you. But, uh, yeah, he did. But, uh, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a film that sh- it just had failure written all over it because what an audacious idea. And especially making a long comedy, if you go back and look at uh, – a lot of the comedies that uh, we we 
revere these days from the classic era, you know, the Raw and Hardy comedies, for instance, they were 60, 61 minutes long. Uh, even the Marx Brothers films were about 70, maybe 75 minutes long. Uh, so you, trying to make a three-and-a-half-hour comedy that would sustain for three-and-a-half hours is just beyond the pale, you would think. And uh, it ended up going way over budget, the most expensive comedy ever made up to that point, by far. Uh, and uh, essentially, no one had ever dared try it before. No one has tried it since. It's unique. It is very unique. Um, you know, I can only think of um, some of the Judd Apatow movies for length, but definitely I, I can't think of anybody that's tried to cram as many. The thing about all the personalities you have to work with, with all those big stars on yeah. one set, they probably yeah, all want to get the line that they want. That's interesting. I really, uh, yeah. I can't wait. Um, how long? Uh, well, the Three yeah. Stooges are in it, Don Knotts. Jeez. There are a lot of cameos in it where they just do one scene. And uh, Jim Backus, uh, Mickey Rooney, as you said, uh, I, I just go blank after a while. I've got my so much of this data in my head right now, I can't rattle it off as easily as I should be able to. Well, what's exciting you about it right now? What's what's like what you're really digging your teeth into that you're like, oh, man, I, I can't do anything until I figure this out right here? Yeah, well, it's, there's a lot of problem solving in doing a book like that. Actually, I got, I got familiar with It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World because I was taken to see it on my birthday in 1963. And they built a theater here in Hollywood just for it. Wow. It was called the Cinerama Dome. It still exists. It's on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, it's closed right now, but it was a geodesic dome, the world's largest geodesic dome. And uh, they created it for what was known as the new Cinerama, which was a single lens Cinerama, which is really essentially anamorphic, uh, 70 millimeter. And uh, so uh, they decided that they wanted a the theater for it, and they built it in 16 weeks in order to have it ready in time for the premiere of the film. The film premiered in early November of 1963. I saw it on November 16, 1963, and then on November 22nd, as anyone who was alive back then would remember, was the assassination of President John Kennedy. Oh, wow. So and, it probably got it overshadowed by that, right? Well, in a sense, yeah, but that's where the social history comes in. I still haven't gotten to that part yet, which was that uh, uh, people emerged from the fog of that assassination, and uh, they wanted to laugh. Mad Mad World became the biggest hit in the country. Yeah, so it had a budget of $9.4 million and made a box office of $60 million. No, that wasn't million. the budget. That's what it cost. In 1962 dollars, uh, I think if you'd have to multiply that by 10 or something to bring it up to modern uh, money, but um, it would have cost 100 million to do it today. Mm, and yeah. uh, uh, it, but it was budgeted; it was approved at five million. And one of Stanley Kramer's great challenges was uh, keeping the lights on and keeping uh, keeping the movie going when uh, the people who were financing it were saying, hey, you said you were going to make this for $5 million. It's now $7.5 million, that sort of thing. So uh, uh, to, to keep the number of balls in the air that he had to do to make this film come off is just astonishing. No, you're, you're 100% right. Uh, I was looking at the conversion rate, like by 10, but pretty much 10.14. So... That would be yeah. what six was it six hundred million or six? What is that six by? Uh, well, it, 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 if you say nine million, you're you're getting up to a hundred million these days. Yeah, that's insane. And so then it would be six hundred yeah. million. Wow, that is. Um, and do you think it still holds up now, or do you think we have to kill another yeah. president before we can watch it again? No, <laughs> no. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it holds up very well. It's a good big audience film, but it's a type of film that was back in the day as a road show uh, attractions, you know, like Lawrence of Arabia and The Sound of Music, where you went, you you bought a particular seat to sit in like you do when you go into a, to a Broadway play. Uh, there was an intermission. Uh, you had six-track stereophonic sound, super widescreen, uh, beautiful new theater to see it in. Um, the uh, uh, it was really an event to see a film like this. And uh, uh, you can still have that experience. You know, when they reopen the Cinerama Dome, they're doing some uh, remodeling of some of the other theaters that are attached to it right now. But when they reopen it, uh, every year they run the, uh, the the great Cinerama films again um, in that theater. And one of them is Mad World. And uh, 
I always I always try to go when they show it there because it's the closest I can come to stepping back into 1963. Oh my gosh, I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, that does sound like something um, like, a, like a once in a lifetime kind of thing. You don't know how long that's going to be around. You know? Yeah. That's um, yeah. No, that's really crazy. It's but it's it's a it's I always thought it to be a fascinating, unique uh, film, and uh, so I wanted to know more about the. Uh, how it came about, who got the idea, more about the writers and the the, the director, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, this is turning into a much longer book than I thought it was going to be. I'm going to have to get it finished and then slice it down a bit. But uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I'm amazed by the amount of material that was out there available. Yeah, it seems like just the building of the theater alone could be a book. There's just It sounds like quite a feat. Well, that's just one small aspect of it, though, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, and and the life it's had since then, because it's never been out of circulation. It's always been available. Although it was also cut quite a bit. Uh, they took out thirty minutes, thirty forty minutes, I think, of it. Uh, uh, well, it was still in its roadshow uh, period, but uh, uh, and efforts to restore it have not been successful so far. But. Uh, it's what remains is still a remarkable experience. Yeah, it, I'm putting that on my list. It's a mad, 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 mad world is the movie. Yeah, four mads. <laughs> it's really mad. And then yeah. um, Mr. Curtis, uh, Mr. James Curtis is working on that book. We can't uh, wait till it's on the shelves and we can read all about uh it's a mad, mad, mad world. And so uh, just to talk th about uh, Fields again, my, like I said, these might be silly questions. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, as a biographer with Fields and just trying to like, so are, are there, as a biographer, are there certain steps that you just kind of, um, it's part of your workflow. This is what I'm going to start with. I, I know that you said the triage stuff. Do you always start with the interviews first and then the interviews yeah, lead you to the, the other uh, stuff? Perishable stuff. Oh. The, the interviews are the perishable thing. So you want to get to the people who, you want to talk to as soon as possible and uh these days there aren't a lot left from the periods i tend to work in i mean it's amazing to me that mad world is 61 years old now I, 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 and therefore the the keaton films which i worked with last time they're 100 years old yeah so why why that uh, period why, why that period do you like to do you choose in that well um because when i was a kid uh, Los Angeles Television had uh, seven uh, VHF stations, and uh, they ran a mixture of everything. It was before the days like we have now, where you know every every particular subject has its own channel. You know, you have the Wheat Germ Channel these days. <laughs> Back then, it was a big mix-up of things, and you saw every channel that you watched. Uh, uh, you got travel shows, you got cartoons in the afternoon, you got uh, exercise programs, you got old movies, you, you got uh, syndicated TV stuff. You got everything. It was a grab bag. And uh, a lot of these films were available on television at all hours of the day and night. In fact, they were all night movies as well, and you'd have car dealers uh, showing them and uh, – uh, you'd sit through three-minute uh, used car commercials in between uh, uh, segments of the movie. Uh, so I got to see a lot of that stuff. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd stay up until, you know, one or two in the morning watching something, you know. And uh, so it was cheap, easy entertainment. And uh, a lot of the people who made those films that I saw on television were still around and in a lot of cases still making them, you know, like John Wayne and... Uh, um, People like that who were in films in the 30s and 40s and are st were still uh, making them. Uh, and on television, you could see a lot of people like that. Like, you know, Jack Benny, I saw him do a couple of his TV specials, uh, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, people like that. Uh, I even saw Boris Karloff once uh, do a uh, rehearse a Red Skelton show. So it, 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 I had that kind of background and... Uh, it just made me curious about certain people, certain events, et cetera. And so that's why I dug, it in, dug into it is because I, I had that interest and I wanted to know the answers to my questions. No, I think that's, uh, that's the best answer is any, uh, especially since, you know, you definitely grew up on that stuff. It seems why not yeah. do what you're interested in as opposed to yeah. write about what you're not. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, uh, and it seems I'm good at it, so so I, I I do it for that reason too. But I I enjoy what I do. You're very good at it. When did you decide that you wanted to do biographies, or just did you want to be a biographer? Uh, back in 1975, I've been doing this for almost 50 years now, and I became interested in a director named James Whale, and uh, became curious about him and wanted to know more about him because uh, there was a local. Uh, film celebration out here called Film X in Hollywood and later in Century City, and they did a tribute to James Whale one year. And it was it was like a film festival where you had new stuff that was in competition, and you had uh, a good, uh, generous uh, amount of older films. And so I got to see a lot of films that you couldn't see on television at the, in those days. Uh, and James Whale died mysteriously. And uh, so I sought out people who knew him and asked questions just for the sake of it. And uh, that turned into uh, – I was going to college at the time, and I was uh, working not full-time at that point, but almost. And so uh, I just took it on as something I was personally interested in doing, and uh, it kind of uh, blossomed from there. Well, very good. I'm glad that uh, you decided to choose uh, W.C. Fields as, as one of your choices. I really do appreciate that, sir, and I really do appreciate your time. This was Mr. James Curtis, the author of a Buster Keaton's uh, biography, a, a Life in Film. Or, or, or a filmmaker's life. A filmmaker's life. I apologize. And then W. C. Fields, a biography. Uh, this is the award-winning James Curtis. You can uh, find out more information jamescurtis.net. J a m e s c u r t i s dot n e t dot net. James Curtis. Um, he was here for the full hour. I'm going to have this interview Please. up as uh, soon as possible and post it in the W. C. Fields fan group. Um, and in the future, um, once you get done with your other book, uh, I probably would have had a chance to really uh, dig into W.C. Fields more Fields questions and, and definitely going to get your Buster Keaton book. And I want to read um, It's a Grim Business, uh, and I want to watch th this movie, everybody. It's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, you, you should also, you're a comedian also, you tell me, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a stand-up comedian. Yeah. You should get my. You should read my book on Mort Saul, who uh, was essentially the inventor of modern comedy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would, yeah. Mort Saul. Thank you. Uh, he he's the guy that put politics in uh, in comedy. He started in 1953. Interesting. Yeah. No. I I, I love um, learning more about just these uh, super talented, just genius people, and I love just the class and dignity. And uh, I don't know. This really made. Um, I don't know. This really showed what you could do with a little bit of a, a little bit of class and, and a little bit of time and effort and stuff. But um, so I guess last question, <laughs> last question. I want to. Um, oh, sorry. W C Fields Group, not fan. All right. Well, the the chat's getting mad at me. Uh, I want to plug it correctly. <laughs> w C Fields Group. You guys can check that out on Facebook. The Facebook W C Fields Group. They've been super great. Uh, they're big fans of uh, James Curtis. Uh, uh, I have one last question, and then I uh, please want anything you want to leave us with. But um, is there any um, misconceptions uh, besides obviously that Fields was kind of just a drunk uh, who didn't really he kind of just stumbled through his career? Are there any pet peeve misconceptions about W C Fields that um, that you know? You use one to clarify, or that you know, to kind of annoy you whenever you hear about him getting brought up. I guess if there's any. Well, uh, just just simply that he was a lot more deliberate in what he did than people uh, seem to think, and that uh, he was one of our great comedic talents. Uh, that's that's the best I can say about him. He he was one of the most distinctive personalities in uh, popular arts in the uh, 20th century, and. Uh, uh, anything that helps perpetuate the memory of his work and uh, gives him exposure is uh, great in my book. Fantastic, Mr. Curtis. And I, honestly, I, I really do thank you for writing the definitive biography, what John Cleese calls the definitive biography of W.C. Fields. You'll learn more than you want to know. The, the thing is, is I almost say, if you if you want to know about just the myth and you love the myth, maybe don't read this right away because you know it's it's very <laughs> clinical. 
and he really gets down to who Fields was, who who you know what what he did, um, just a very very clinically. And it's a uh, it's a book that you that that I I never thought would exist. And when I'm, as I'm reading it, you're just like, wow, it's it's so impressive, uh, Mr. Curtis. Thank you so much for your time. Is there any uh, final words that you want to let the uh, audience know? You have the WC Fields fans listening. <laughs> I can't think of anything other than if you haven't read the book, uh, please do so. Yeah, and buy it. Buy the book. Uh, and if you're ever in San Antonio on any kind of book tour or anything, please uh, reach out. I'd love to uh, see you in person, get this signed, and hope maybe have you in studio uh, for another interview, if, if you don't mind, sir. Okay, sure. Will do. <laughs> All right, Mr. Curtis. Thank you so much for your patience, sir, and I hope you have a great rest of uh, your day, sir. Thanks you so much. Okay, my pleasure, Alonzo. Bye now. Bye, sir. Wow. Ace. I don't want to embarrass myself too much. About 30 minutes. Uh, oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Ted. Uh, thank you so much, uh, James, again, for, for everything. Um, does he think Whale committed suicide? I wish you would have asked in the uh, chat. I would have definitely asked him that. If he thought that Whale committed suicide... Um, if you go to uh, James, um, Jesus Christ, JamesCurtis.net, you guys go to JamesCurtis.net, um, he has his email there to contact him. Obviously, don't, you know, ask him questions, but um, uh, he was very uh, kind to me and, and answered my questions. So uh, I'm sure if you had a question about James Will, it seems like he's definitely, um, you know, it sounds like that was like the first thing that got him into writing biographies. And I have his Wikipedia uh, article pulled up. He was the director of, uh, it looks like... Um, I think he was a film director, so he did Frankenstein, Old Dark House, The Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein. So just that, uh, that classic, um, that classic good stuff that everybody loves. So I'm definitely gonna check that out. I'm also gonna check out Mort Saul. I'm gonna check out it's a mad, mad, mad world. So yeah, uh, for Honest George in the chat, I would email him and ask him if he feels uh, if uh, well committed suicide or what he meant by the mysterious circumstances. I um. There's all kinds of things I wanted to uh, kind of follow up on him when uh, when I was talking, but he, then he would say something else, and you wanted to ask about that, and um, yeah, it, he just obviously has so much uh, information, and it, it was definitely just intimidating to to try to think about stuff that he hasn't already been asked, or that people couldn't just. I don't want to ask him stuff that people couldn't just um, either find very easily by any wc fields documentary or by reading the book so i do apologize if i um retread anything i didn't see a lot of uh, comments in the chat um with any particular questions so i'm hoping i covered at least some stuff and um, i definitely wanted to ask uh, mr curtis about just this process and uh thanks for anybody for listening uh, we had some technical issues in the first half of the show and we got it fixed before the uh, the James Curtis interview. So I'm actually super happy about that. Thanks. Oh, I'm really excited that that went, that that went well. Mr. Curtis is very nice. I'm about to uh, finish up the show, y'all. We do this every Saturday. Anybody that's listening, I usually don't have um, award-winning authors on the show. But, uh, you know, I've had authors before. We, uh, we've had athletes. Usually we have stand-up comedians on the show. Uh, usually it's me and my uh, stand-up comedian friends. We're talking about current events and just... Whatever's going on. This time it was a solo show. I'm thinking about trying to do maybe one of those a month or something. Just try to flex that muscle. And uh, next week hopefully won't be any uh, silly technical issues. But you know there will be. Because I got that Polly effect. Named after Polly Shore. And uh, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I hope you guys have a uh, great rest of your day. And thanks a lot for tuning in. Badfirstimpressions.com. Check us out next week. And that was a funky dealer. Winner, win pay the front line, take the don'ts. He's coming out again for a new point. Get your bets down, ladies and gentlemen. Four fours to point, mark four. Ace, two, scrap, one, 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 four. Ace, two, ace, ace, two, scrap, scrap, one, four. Scrap, one, four. Who wants the, who wants the hard four? Five, one, four. Check me out, John. Nine a winner, got a hot hand. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. and a good one. Coming out for a new point. Get your bets down, ladies and gentlemen. He's a rolling point is nine. Place nine. Place nine. Eight, shooting for nine. Five, shooting for nine. He's a rolling point is nine. Place nine. Eight, shooting for nine. Five, shooting for nine. Who wants to come? Six to point. Place your bets. Who wants to come? Six the point. Who wants to come? Six the point.
place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 